Um, you guys are in a little bit of a, a, a different place, uh, ex both expectation-wise and where you are in your in your development as a as a team uh, than you were even at this time last year or when Jordy was even hired. Um, how do you, I guess, navigate um, the different expectations and um, different place where you are in your development from even three months ago? Well, I think it's, you mentioned us, it, it starts with us having honest, transparent conversations, Ryan, because things have certainly changed over the course of the summer uh, and things will continue to evolve. So as long as we're on the same page and using the same language and it's being um, spread down through the organization and the players, I think that's, that's, that's paramount and that's got to be clear of where we're going, the direction we're going in. What's up, fellas? Good to see you both. Sean, I, I guess a lot of times, like, the media and pundits, they'll have expectations for teams. But from you yourself as the voice of the organization, what do you consider to be, I guess, fair expectations for the team as we see it now going into the year? Yeah, I think it's important not to get wrapped up in, in potentially what Vegas odds look like, what uh, media, pundits, what have you. Um, they're, they're, everyone's got a job to do. Our job out here and, and Geordie's job on the court is to help develop a culture, develop an identity, and establish that as the season goes on. Ultimately, our goal has been the same way every year is to go out there and compete, and compete at the highest level, no matter what the stakes may be and no matter what's being put in front of you, is to go and compete and establish that identity through that. Uh, for me, myself, it's, it's we're, from the front office side, we're looking at it from like, who are the next Nets? You know, who do we look at and say, okay, this person can be part of this rebuild and this person's on the team for the next two, three years. That's going to be important for us. What contracts look good for us? How are guys developing? Development is going to be, you know, if it's not 1A, it's certainly 1B for sure in terms of uh, some of the young guys we have and the young guys we're going to be bringing in. Hey, Sean. Hey, Jordy. Um, I know you've done kind of, Sean, sorry, uh, I know you've done the rebuild cycle before um, with this new CBA, with the new constraints that are in place that weren't there <coughs> years prior. Um, how does that change or does it change how you approach a rebuild and um, approach the way you look at it from a multi-year perspective? Yeah, I don't know that we can put a timetable on it. I think it's a great question because it does look different. You know, this the landscape of the league now is is nobody has gone through this before. So 30 teams have inherited this new CBA, and we're all trying to figure out how we're going to react to it. And uh, there'll be a first responder, there'll be a last responder, and there'll be people who are late to it. Um, we've never had an opportunity like this before, and that's what excites both Jordy and I and the rest of the group here is – when you have, whether it's the draft assets or the room coming up and the young players and the players we have on this roster uh, to help build and see what it looks like over the course of the next year, too. that's exciting to me because we've already got a little bit of a nucleus. We've got some pieces. Uh, I, don't, I couldn't even tell you how we're going to use them. I think staying flexible um, with, with what we have is going to be really important as, as we build this throughout this year. But it's a heck of an opportunity for all of us to go through this and uh, – I think we have the right people, whether it's from the coaching staff, from a development standpoint, from the front office, to be as creative as we possibly can under, under new CBA guidelines and rules and so forth. And just like us, 29 other teams will, will figure this out, some sooner than others, and, uh, and some will take advantage of others. But um, you know, it's just a matter of what is on your timeline. Sean, in your prior answer, you spoke about youth development those are kind of going to be buzzwords you know for this team and this organization but for the veterans who maybe are at a different stage in their career you know what is entering the season what has your dialogue been like with them and you know how do you kind of envision them fitting into this team you know going into a season where there's going to be a lot of talk and a lot of rumors about them yeah. potentially not being a part of it at the end of the season yeah i think it's really important for for everybody including you mentioned the vets specifically the veterans to ne not necessarily read into what everybody else's opinions may be. I think if you look at every rebuild and every team uh, uh, around the league, it is paramount and incredibly important to have the right type of veterans on your roster and the right guys that are going to buy in and help lead and, and help be a voice for, for Geordie and the coaching staff. You know, they've got to be sending the right message to the young guys. 
I get it, their timelines may not look quite the same as what the organizations may look like and so forth. And I think that's where it's really important to have transparent conversations with them and honest conversations with them. And we've had those conversations. Um, you know, I think they know what's expected of them. We know what's expected of, of, of vice versa. So um, for us, it's just to keep, keep the door open. You know, if they need to come in and have a conversation with Jordy or myself, it's always open. We're going to be clear and honest with them as to, like, here, here's where the team is heading. Here's what we're looking to do. And, I, and we expect that on the same end on, on their part. Uh, kind of circling back to the player development, you know, aspect of it all, and I'd love to hear from both of you on this, but, you know, Noah, Dariq, Jalen, what kind of summers have they had, and what's kind of the plan for, with them going forward? I'll let Jordy, because he's seen it more than me on the court. I think their summer has been great. Uh, you guys have seen it in Summer League, a uh, team that was extremely competitive. Uh, yes, we have one award, that it was one guy that got the MVP, on Jalen Wilson, but I think that speaks of everybody's work, uh, what his teammates did. He got the award, but I think he said it, the group of the coaches that we put together here, they did an amazing job. I wasn't around, but I could watch it. Um, and I think that that's the... That was a good first step. And then going into into training camp, uh, I'm not guaranteeing anything to anybody. No minutes, no starting spots, no rotation, nothing. Uh, and I want everybody to work, show up, get 1% better every day, and compete. That's uh, what we're going to be about, part of our identity. And all these young guys um, have to come in ready, uh, same as the vets and everybody else. Hey guys, um, Sean, you may have asked this earlier when I, before I walked in, but just, I guess, going back to the previous rebuild, you obviously said you learned lessons from that. Um, can you even use those lessons with this new climate with the CBA, or do you lean on those lessons to kind of help guide what you guys want to try to do with this rebuild? Yeah, yeah great question. Probably the latter. Uh, I mean, I think there's some lessons we can certainly learn about, you know, establishing identity and implementing a system and having a competitive nature about how we go about doing things. And we talk about being competitive, not just on the court, but behind the scenes. Everything we do, we want to be the best we possibly can be. I mean, whether you're in an old CBA, a new CBA, or the, the next CBA, those things don't really change. So I think it's bringing in the right people, bringing in curious people, uh, like-minded people that are going to push, think a little bit outside the box. That's what we've always done. And, uh, you, you know, I think going through... When I first got here with the group, you know, many of those people have since moved on and, and they've taken their traits to, to other teams and stuff. So I've been very fortunate for the time I've spent with them, whether it was coaches or front office performance staff. Now we've got some new faces in here who have come from different walks of life. And I think that's really important to people to look at this from a critical eye and say, well, OK, you did it this way last time. What about this side? The CBA looks a little different. You know, the way you play may look a little different. The roster certainly looks different than when we, when I first inherited here. And as I mentioned before, the um, the draft assets um, and the flexibility that we have moving forward are unlike, I think, possibly anybody's ever seen before. Sean, what's the latest on Ben? And are you confident that this is a season where he can string together, you know, good health? Yeah. Well, I certainly hope so for Ben's sake. I mean, you never want to see anybody um, have to go through a couple back surgeries like he had and sit out. Um, you know, being the competitive guy that he is, you, you wish him well. You hope he, he can get out there on the court. From what we've seen so far with Ben, you know, Ben will be a, a full going camp, which for us, that's exciting to see. And, uh, you know, for him, I think he, he's chomping at the bit to be able to get out there and contribute. So this is a big, this is a big year for him, just like it is for, for the rest of us. Kind of following up on this question, this is for both of you. I'm curious, Jordy, I mean, you spent some time with Ben. I mean, what were your impressions of him, uh, both physically, health-wise, and, were, you know, his headspace in terms of being able to come back and finally get on the court and play the way he would want? And right. where I was also going to ask just a health update on Boyan and where he is and health-wise in terms of coming into camp, would he be available? <clears throat> So starting with Boyan, um, successful surgery. He's working. Um, he's in a very good place. Uh, we see him every day putting in his work. He's not going to be ready to start camp. Um, that's what we know at, the, at this moment. And then Ben has been, has been very good. Uh, had a successful, successful surgery. Uh, really good summer. 
he seems in a very good place. And, and, you know, like Sean just said, he'll be full go to start camp. But, like, we'll treat him the same way as everybody else. We'll go through practice. We evaluate how everybody feels, and then we'll make decisions. And that's why we have a great medical staff, performance staff, and we'll work all together as a unit. So excited to see Ben uh, on the court in day one. Hey, Jordy. Uh, I'm just wondering, for you as a coach, not to get too specific with stats and stuff, but when you're evaluating this team through 20, 30 games, what indicators are you looking for to say, okay, we're off to a competitive start, the competitive start Sean mentioned. What are your sort of benchmarks as a coach that you want to, you know, your must-haves in terms of being successful? Uh, it's a good question, um, but definitely on the defensive end, I want a team that – uh, we pressure the ball, and we're ex extremely physical. We're connected, so we can, you know, prove that we're, you know, we're communicating and talking. Everybody knows what, what they're doing, but also you see that flying around mentality. Uh, and with all that, you know, those multiple efforts, you can put stats to all that, right? Uh, you know, what's your ball pressure percentage? Uh, how you. How you defend without fouling? How you, you know, how many verticalities you have? Charges, so and so forth. Um, and same as offensively, you know, everybody says we that everybody in the NBA wants to play fast, right? But how are you going to do it? We want to play fast in the full court and the half court. I've been part of teams from Canada to Sacramento to Denver that played very fast. Denver in the half court more in the full court. How can we, you know, develop that here? Uh, same as you know. Uh, Body movement and ball movement. Teams that that move the ball are more unpredict, uh, non predictable, harder to guard. You can take better shots. How again can we develop this here with a younger group of guys? A lot of times you cannot control if the shot is going to go in, but what you can control is to teach what's the right shot and what do we want. And I know that uh, having a great coaching staff, we can teach that, and uh, and you know that's what I expect in the first. You said. 10, 20 games is look at all those numbers and be satisfied with that and knowing that we're in the right path. Uh, one for both of you guys. Jordy, after um, watching Cam Thomas's tape from last season, just what were your impressions of him as a player and you know plans for him offensively this season? And then, Sean, you guys, um, starting in October, will have a little bit of a window to negotiate an extension with Cam. Are there any plans to you know engage with him about potentially moving forward with that? You said offensively or defensively? Offensively. OK. Um, you know, I think development is the number one thing. And uh, everybody, not just the young guys, but also the veterans, everybody's, it has to get better. There has to be a plan. And uh, my conversations with Cam are, can I help you be a more, more efficient of a scorer, right? Uh, if you look at his numbers, the less he dribbles, the more efficient he is to the top of the NBA like it's impressive his his superpower is, is to score the ball and what we need to do is to help him do that but in an efficient way uh, same as his playmaking because uh, he attracts so much attention teams are going to try to blitz him load to him how he can kick that and create more assists potential assists so it's on me uh, and the rest of the coaching staff to help him and we believe uh, he can take that next step yeah, you mentioned Cam uh, in, in terms of extension talks. There are several guys on our team that we could be having those same conversations with. So we'll certainly engage with agents and with the players, and um, I think it's important to always have that door open. You know, um, The window will certainly close on the, on the extension if we can't get something done, but I think it's important for those players to know that we care about them and here's where we see them and whether the timing is right this year or if it's next offseason you know, from an organizational standpoint and also from their standpoint. So, I mean, they'll be, they'll be weighing up what we're doing. It's just the same as, as we're going to be, you know, figuring out if they're the right fit long term and so forth. And, and if now is the right time to extend uh, all of our guys. The franchises bring Killian Hayes to camp. What do you guys think of him as a player and his kind of journey in the NBA to this point and the situation he currently finds himself in here in Brooklyn? Yeah, I think for where we are, it's important to bring in several guys like that, you know, like Killian, who have, for whatever reason, it, it ha they haven't stuck on several teams, and, and I think you've you've sort of seen that mo with us in the past. 
um, we were brought guys in, and, and if you have a good development staff, which we do, they're able to keep developing these guys and give these guys a second chance. I'm a big proponent of that. This is not like a, a one and done. So Killian, just like the rest of these guys, are going to have every opportunity to come in and prove that they're, they're a net and they can be part of this, this group. Um, I think what I've seen so far with the guys coming in here and, you know, on their own accord and, be, you know, and, and fighting for fighting with each other and building team chemistry and their pickup games and so forth, but they're all coming in with a chip on their shoulder. And you've, you've heard me mention that in the past, but I think finding guys that have something to prove and having a chip on their shoulder is really important. And often that chip grows when you've been looked over in the past. So, you know, to, to be able to bring those guys in and give them that second or third opportunity is, is, is great. Jordy, when you were introduced, you talked about Nick Claxton and his potential. You mentioned, obviously, he can be Defensive Player of the Year. Now that he's locked in, I guess, what do you see for him now, just that he's, you know, obviously someone who's been at this franchise almost as long as any player now. Like, how do you see his role growing, and how do you see yourself leaning on him, kind of le maybe leading this this young group? Yeah. Um, so Nick is no longer the young kid, right? So he is – if you think about the prime of a basketball player, I think they say 25, 26. So he's right there. Uh, obviously, our commitment with him, he was our priority, one of our priorities this summer. Uh, we're very happy to have him right now in the long term. So his role, his leadership, uh, that's what's going to change, right? Uh, right now, he has to be an example for the younger guys, but for everybody else. He has to lead by example. Uh, like you said, uh, we all have also – personal goals he you know should be there for defensive player of the year uh, his playmaking should go up we'll play through him with dribble handoff catches at the elbow and he's pretty good at playmaking for others same as putting pressure on the rim and it's not just for him to finish but also to open up the three-point line so uh, very excited because he's going to be an important piece for us Sean you mentioned you know you, you want to have certain guys in camp guys like Killian kind of with that logic you know, what was the reason for this franchise trading for Zaire Williams? I mean, I think when you look at Zaire or any particular trade you do, it's what's coming back to us. Does that particular player fit our timeline? Is it somebody like, you know, a young asset that we can help develop? Is it a pick coming back to us? I mean, I think with Zaire, it's somebody we've focused on for, for a long time, ever since his draft workouts. So, you know, to be able to now bring him in here, and I think he's got a lot of intangibles, size and length and so forth. It's been exciting to see, you know, how he's, what he's shown out there in just pickup games. So when camp starts and coaches really get to coach him, um, that's exciting for me. Like, I mean, he has things that you, you can't teach, you know. And again, as I mentioned, those chip on your shoulders. You know, he's been a guy that has had some opportunity but hasn't really seized it for whatever reason. Maybe it's been through injury, which, he's, which he had in Memphis and so forth. But... I, again, whether it's Zaire, Nick Claxton, Dayron Sharp, you name it, the list goes on. It's like go out there and compete. That's going to be important that we find out who is part of this group. You're one, two, three, you know, so forth. Hey, Sean. Uh, do you sense that there are more variables in the long-term planning here as compared to the last rebuild? Because you might have a lot of cap space. You might not with extensions. You don't know where you'll be picking, you know, in the draft lottery. So I guess, is there a level of, not uncertainty, but different ways, you know, this rebuild could go in year one? And how does that affect your decision making? Yeah, I don't know that, I, I mean, I probably wouldn't use, there are variables for sure. You know, I would look at it like it's fluid and flexible, right? And that, to me, that's exciting when, when you can go in a lot of different avenues and we're going to have to uh, make those decisions when they present themselves. Like some of those things are out of my hands. I don't know where the ping pong balls will, will fall, right? And I, you know. I don't know how guys are going to develop over the course of this year, but to me it's super exciting to know that, you know, in three months from now when, you know, Jordy and I sit down and, you know, have a mid-season recap and go, hey, w where are we thinking? You know, who's developed more than we thought? That's exciting. This guy could be part of this for a long term, you know, and so forth. Um, we'll let the rest of the chips fall where they may, but, uh, again, it's, it's going to be having flexibility and fluidity throughout this uh, and just keeping that in the back of our mind. Jordy, whether it was in Sacramento or Denver, you have you have coached offenses where you know what you guys do runs through a big man. Whether it's Nikola Jokic or um, Demontis Sabonis. With that in mind, when you look at Nick Claxton, you know 
Early in the summer, you talked about what he can be defensively. You view him as a future defensive player of the year in this league. But what do you think his ceiling is offensively? And what kind of adjustments is he going to have to make to his game to be able to run the kind of offenses that you've run in the past? Uh, it's a good question. Um, you know, I don't want Nick to be uh, Nicola. I don't, I don't need Nick to be Domas. I need Nick to be Nick. And uh, me and the rest of the coaching staff will help him with – you know, uh, giving him, you know, those touches where he can be more of a playmaker. Obviously, he's a great, you know, player at screening and rolling to the rim. So uh, I'm not worried about him, you know, trying to be those guys. Um, you know, you've mentioned uh, Sack in, uh, in Denver, but also with Canada. We've had a different player. We found a way that – to buy into ball movement, pain touches, pace. Uh, and at the end of the day, you know, the, the best thing about a coaching staff is, you know, you have guys that are smarter than you and better than you at doing other things. And that's why they're going to, you know, help the group and come up with ideas. And uh, we'll, we'll find a way to, for Nick to have a big impact. So um, I'm excited about this uh, for this year for him. It's for either of you. Um, Noah, you know, played center a lot in the G League last season and then came up here, played some power forward, played center, obviously has a, you know, very versatile skill set. So how are you guys viewing him positionally entering this season? So I think one thing I've learned is as a head coach, I don't think you have all the answers. And I don't think I need to have him right now. And going through the process is also a part you know, we are part of the process. And uh, that doesn't mean that we all make mistakes, but that doesn't mean that we have to see it that way, right? Like Noah's going to be – we're going to put him in situations that either he's comfortable or not comfortable, and then we'll see how he reacts. But the same as everybody else. So uh, to answer your question is, I don't know at this second, I think he can be very good at playing the four, very good at playing the five. The kid can shoot. His size is, you know, multi-positional. Like, he's got, you know, a lot of good qualities and abilities to be successful. So do we do I need to decide right now if he's a 4 or 5? No. Uh, it's going to be important to find groups that they can play together. And going back to his question with how we impact the game, the style of play, how we want to play, how we're efficient, how Noah can do that at the 4 and the 5. So, um like I said, I'm not willing to have all the answers, but I'm willing to work through it and, and see it at some point. I think on that note, you just don't want to limit development, right? Like we, we sit up here and say he's a four, and then Jordy plays him as a five in a month's time from now. Your questions will be like, I thought you said you saw him as a four. Like I, you, I, I think we should ever limit a player because I think we've seen that over the course of you know eternity, guys end up evolving and the game evolves too. And the, the fact that he is a versatile player that's something that's probably intriguing to all of us, coaches included. Jory, for you, you've – sorry, right here, Jory. <laughs> you, you talked about how much you've, you've coached since you were a teenager, so I'm curious for you going into your first camp, how much do you feel prepared for this moment, knowing that you've obviously been on several staffs, you've coached for a bulk of your life. How, how much do you feel prepared for, for this moment, taking over your first training camp? Um, I feel very excited, and I think – that's the number one thing, like bringing energy into everything you do in your life. It's very important because I think that's contagious. Am I going to make mistakes? No question, like for sure. Uh, but I also want to make honest mistakes. That means that I'm trying to do what's best for the team, right? And the longer I'm in this business, I'll make less mistakes and then you'll go. And, you know, I think that I'll treat this everybody the same way. Like, players can make honest mistakes as, as long as they're willing to do what's best for the team. If you're supposed to run to the corner, run hard to the corner. You're going to step out of bounds. Then we can work on that, how your footwork is, because you try, you're trying to do the right thing, right? Uh, so I could give you a lot of examples with that. But, yeah, I feel great about training camp. Um, like I said before, having all the answers is not a problem for me right now. But the energy that I'm going to bring and the coaches and – you know, I think we're going to have a really good training camp because what we can do at this second is control the controllables. And everything else, what I cannot control, I'm going to worry about it. Jordy, uh, right here in the middle. Um, 
which which people or person over your life has had kind of the largest influence on you in how you want to be as a head coach? And then functionally, how do you think you'll implement whatever those learnings or teachings were now that you're in this position? I mean, as a person, I would say my father. Um, you know, he played sports, played handball. I wa- grew up watching him play really tough sport. I don't know if you guys have watched it in the Olympics, but those guys are tough. Um, and, you know, one thing that my dad has always said is if you ever realize you've made a mistake, you just got to own it and go, you know, tell that person, hey, you know what, I made a mistake. So um, I, you know, I think in, in coaching is extremely important because I'm going to be telling guys what to do all the time. So if I'm telling you what to do all the time or if you've made an honest mistake or not, and if I have to treat everybody the same way and tell a tell everybody who's made a mistake in front of everybody because everybody's the same on a team, then when I do make it, I'll be the first one. And I realize I'll be the first one to own it. So that's one. Uh, other mentors, obviously, bas- in the basketball world, uh, Mike Brown is the one that brought me here. Michael Malone, the one that brought me to the front of the bench. Sergio Scariola, David Blatt. So I learned a lot from those guys. And, you know, that's why I feel, going back to your question, prepared to – start training camp, bring it, have a lot of fun, energy, uh, and, and, you know, be, be out there on the court and sweat with the guys. This is um, one from, for each of you. Jordy, I'm going to ask you a question that probably has been asked to every single coach that Ben Simmons has had. Um, how do you see him, how do you see being able to space the floor with him when he's out there with, uh, whatever, another non-shooter, like Nick or whomever? Um, and in Sean's case, when we talked to Cam Johnson uh, in Vegas and we asked him um, after the trade, how did he see himself fitting into the long-term plans here? I believe his quote was, well, he still had to talk to you, we'll see, or that's still undetermined. Um, months later, I'm curious how that conversation went and how it's been determined. Um, so as far as Ben, um, we want to – we want to play fast, right? So he's one of the the best playmakers to be able to do that, from rebounding to pushing to throwing the ball ahead. His paint touch is unbelievable. He's big, built like a truck, could get into the paint and spray, get to the rim. Um, and then, you know, as far as shot quality, if you can play fast, touch the paint and, and move the ball and reverse the ball, uh, you know, body movement, ball movement, all that stuff, Ben really fits all that. Now, are we playing like this because of Ben? No, because that's the identity. That's Sorry, that's the style of play that we want for our team. And then moving forward, once we find Nets players for the future, then, you know, this thing can evolve. Uh, but going back to your question, Ben really, if you think about it, a healthy Ben Simmons, you know, the number one thing for him and that we care the most about is his health. Ben being healthy, Ben is a very good player. And Ben being healthy, he can rebound, push, do all that stuff that can help us create really good shots. Uh, If you go back back two years ago when Ben and Nick played together, their minutes together were very good. Last year, the sample size was very small. They only played 10 games together out of the 15 he he played. So it's you cannot use those numbers. So I'm, again, not concerned, but at the same time, I don't know the I don't have the answer right now and I don't need to have it. I I'm excited to go through training camp and see these guys fight really hard and I want them to put me in a tough spot. That means that everybody's doing very well. Uh coach, you spoke earlier about excuse me, not guaranteeing you know anyone anything and you know the best five will be on the floor. But obviously with the amount of young players on the team and where the franchise is now, do you do you see yourself leaning towards just the best five in the court, regardless of how they fit on this team long term, or do you think you'll lean more towards let's get more of the young players, more experience, regardless of what the product look, look, looks like? It's a good question. It's go, it goes back to me not having all the answers right away. Uh, but one thing we want to do is create winning habits. And at the end of the day, as a coach and coaching staff, as you know, we're going to have to put lineups together that play in a way that, you know, what we can achieve the kind of shots we want to do defensively. You know, how can we be very physical, have ball pressure? So all those groups, 
you know, have to be, um, have to be balanced. And in my mind, it's not like I need to start certain guys just because. I'm not going to start, I'm giving you an example, a group of young guys, because when you just give minutes to a young guy, if he didn't earn it, I think it's a mistake. Same thing is just because you're a veteran, I have to give you minutes. For me, it's a mistake. Now, if you're a young player and you're a veteran, if you work hard, you're going to have the chance to play, whether it's starting or in the top 10, because I'm willing to play with 10 players, 10, 9 players. Um, so, you know, it's, uh, it's going to be a battle. It's going to be competitive. And uh, every single player will know that they uh, have an opportunity to achieve their goals. You want me to answer, Brian? Yeah. yeah. So, um, Cam and I have had multiple conversations. It's again that open door policy. Like, you know, I'm on the court, I see him. You know, we go and visit him in the off seasons and so forth. So, I do think it's very important to have that conversation, conversation, especially with the likes of a player like Cam Johnson. He's a true professional. He totally understands with it. And I can be very open with him as to like, you know, hey, here's what we're thinking for this team. Here's what does this line up with you? And he said, look, whatever role there is, wh whatever you want me to do, I'll do it. And that's that's how he's conducting himself here. So, um, you know, that's kind of where it lies. And none of these guys are ever going to be surprised by all of a sudden a pivot in direction or one day they wake up and they, you know, they read, uh, you know, a tweet from you that they're no longer here. I would say Woj, but he's St. Bonaventure. So, but the the point of this is, you've just got to be open with these with these young men. You know, you got to develop a trust there because there's going to be times I, you know, either one of us asks them to do things that they may be uncomfortable doing, whether it's on the court or off the court, and so forth. So, um, they have the right to uh, to hear from me directly. So. Hi, Sean. Hi, Jordy. Um, with with the transition over from last year to this year, how important do you think it is to have solid veterans like a Nick and a Cam Johnson to help sort of establish those positive habits and the next culture you want to see going forward in the future? I'd say absolutely. I mean, that's that's why these guys are here. You know, they were here in the first place last year. I mean, when you're able to acquire guys with us through trades or drafts and so forth and help help develop them and help bring them in and they can be – you know, a secondary voice to Jordy in the locker room, that's incredibly important. So to have good, solid veterans, and it doesn't matter, any sport, any team, any organization, you, you need people like that who have seen it and can story tell because they've been through things. So um, you're, you're constantly trying to help develop the younger guys no matter what, and it, 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 it takes an army. It takes everybody here to be pulling and rowing in the same direction. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Thank you.